Chapter 3, 40 Winks The next day, and the next day, and the next day after that, I smiled at the new boy and gave him a friendly wink, just as often as I could. My goal was to give him at least 40 winks a day, because that's what my mum says everybody needs, but after a while my eyebrows started to feel funny. I could tell the new boy was finding it interesting, because he stopped looking at everyone else and kept looking at me. But then Michael saw me trying to wink with both my eyes, one after the other, and said I looked like I needed a doctor. He probably said that because I can't wink with my left eye as well as I can with my right eye, so I decided to stop winking quite as much. That week, Mrs Carn was teaching us all about photosynthesis and gave each of us a small pot with a seed in it to look after. Everyone was excited because she said there will be a prize for whoever grows the best plant. Even the new boy got one and I think it made him happy because he kept on looking at it. I tried to whisper lots of cheerful words like rainbow and popcorn and marshmallows to mine because I read somewhere that if you tell plants about happy things it makes them grow quicker. I'd never won a prize before, not even at the fairground. I thought if I tried really hard and kept talking to my plant I might win this time. And if I couldn't win, then I wanted the new boy to, because he really seemed to like that plant. But I was worried about Brendan the bully brooker. He's the class bully. His cheeks are always pink because he spends most of his time chasing anyone smaller than him around the playground. He's not very clever and hates anyone that is. If anyone gets a top mark in class or a prize, he'll try and beat them up at home time. I saw him looking at Armet's plant and narrowing his eyes, just like he always does when he's thinking of something mean to do. I didn't like it one bit. His most common trick is to trip you up with his foot. He also likes to tip up your lunch tray as he walks by so that your food dribbles down your chest like runny eggs. He's done that to me many times. Sometimes he gets caught, but most of the time he doesn't. And even when he does get caught, he doesn't get detention. Most of the teachers seem to like him though. Maybe it's because when he smiled, he looks like one of those boys that sing in a church choir on television. Mr Thompson used to call him a rascal, which must be a good word, because he gave Brendan the bully a wink and a pat on the back whenever he said it, and that let him run off again. That made everyone else in class, except for Liam and Chris, Brendan the bully's only two friends, hate him even more. Even the bullies in the upper years find him annoying. It's funny how bullies don't like other bullies. Maybe it stops them from feeling special. But in school, everyone knows who the bullies are and who they like to bully, and no two bullies can go after the same person. It's a strange system, but those are the rules and everyone sticks to them, even the teachers. But Mrs Khan is different. She doesn't seem to like Brendan the bully as much as the other teachers. She's always watching him, and ever since we were put in her class, he's been careful not to do anything around her. I'm still going to keep an eye on him, though. Soon after the new boy joined our class, lots of rumours about him began to be passed around the playground like an invisible game of pass the parcel. Most people believed Jenny and said that the new boy must be dangerous and that's why he was never allowed out. But then other people started saying he had a super contagious disease and that was the real reason why we weren't allowed to talk to him. The disease rumour scared Clarissa so much that she tried to sit as far away from him as she could without leaving her chair. One time she leaned over so far that she crashed right onto the floor. She didn't lean away so much after that, but she always put her arms up or used an exercise book as a divider. I didn't think the new boy looked in the least bit dangerous or like he had an infectious disease, so the rumour I thought sounded the most true was the one that said he was from a super rich family and that his parents had sent him to our school undercover so that he wouldn't be kidnapped. Michael said kidnappers wouldn't come to our school to look for him because it wasn't in a posh area. And Tom agreed. He said that when he had moved from America, his older brothers had told him they must be poor now because they were going to live in the poor end of London and not in the rich end. I didn't really understand what he meant because London doesn't have ends. On maps it just looks like a spilt blob of jam. I wanted to ask the new boy if the rumour about the kidnappers was true and if he needed us to become his bodyguards. But he was still doing all his lessons on his own and every break time and lunch time he would disappear so no one except for Clarissa could talk to him and she didn't want to. I tried to catch his eyes so I could smile at him and whisper hello but Mrs Khan caught me and told me to pay attention to my work. 
Next, I tried to send him a note made into a paper plane, because I'm good at those, but it flew wonkily and hit Nigel on the head instead. He's a tattletale and told me straight away. I had to hate tattletales because they seem to like getting people into trouble more than anything else in the world, and they always smile when they're doing it. Mrs Khan came and took the note and read it just to herself. She shook her head at me, but I think she must have found the drawing I made funny, because her mouth gave a tiny smile that only I could see. Even though I didn't get told off, I knew it would be too risky to send any more messages by air mail, especially with tattletales around. The next day at break time, Josie, Tom, Michael and I decided to follow the new boy and found out where he was going. But Mrs Khan caught us following him in the corridors and told us not to do it again. She didn't seem angry, but she did say that the new boy needed to be in seclusion for a little while longer and that it was for his own good, so we promised not to follow him any more. What does seclusion mean? asked Josie when we went back out onto the playground. None of us knew exactly, not even Michael, although he said it sounded as if the new boy needed to have a private treatment, like a really sick person in a hospital. So maybe he did have an infectious disease after all. But it wasn't long until we found out what seclusion really meant and why the new boy needed so much of it. Chapter 4. What Mr Brown and Mrs Grimsey said. My dad used to say that if you really, really want something, you have to keep on trying for it. And since I always used to say that he had everything he could ever want, I guess he must have known all about trying for things. <clears throat> I knew that I wanted to be friends with Armet. I didn't really know why. I just did. I gave up on trying to speak to him during the day because of all the seclusion he needed. But I figured after school was OK because Mrs Codd had smiled at me and winked that first time. So every day for two whole weeks I waited by the school gates at home time. As soon as the new boy and Mrs Khan came out to meet the woman in the red scarf, I would run over and give the new boy a lemon sherbet, and sometimes a whole chocolate bar. But no matter how many sweets I gave him, or how many Mrs Khan encouraged me to talk to him, the new boy never said a word. And he never, ever smiled back. Not even when I gave him a whole packet of white mice, which are my favourite. He just quietly took the sweets, and staring at the floor, went and stood behind the woman in the red scarf, as if he needed to hide from me. Maybe he doesn't like sweets, said Michael, on the Friday of the second week. Don't be silly, said Josie, chewing on her hair. Everyone likes sweets. Maybe he's allergic, said Tom. I've never heard of anyone being allergic to chocolate and sweets before, but then again, I was allergic to dogs when no one else was, so maybe he was right. After that, I decided to give the new boy my lunch fruit instead of my sweets. He was still going to his seclusion every lunchtime, so on the Monday of the third week of trying to be his friend, I took the biggest orange I could find from the school canteen and waited by the gates. I was extra excited because I had drawn a smiley face on the skin and Tom had given me a sticker of a dinosaur to stick on it, so that was the two things that made the orange extra special. Tom loves collecting stickers. He has books and books of them at home, and whenever he gets a new one he likes, he always brings it in to show us. I've never seen him give a stick away to someone he doesn't know very well, so I hope the new boy would like it and know how special it was. But as we were waiting for the new boy to come out, we heard something about him that we didn't understand at all. In fact, it was even more confusing than learning about the seclusion he was being given. There were lots of grown-ups standing behind us at the gates. There always are at home time. Sometimes they talk about the news, or what they're making for tea, but mostly they talk about the weather. I don't know why, because there's nothing more boring than talking about something everyone else can see for themselves, but I guess that's what you're meant to do when you become a grown-up. Usually, we don't listen because we have more interesting things to talk about, like what we're going to watch as soon as we get home, and who our favourite Olympic athlete or footballer is. But this afternoon, just after someone had said how sunny it was, and wasn't it lovely, and how they hoped it would be sunny again tomorrow, someone else said, have you heard about the new refugee kid that's joined the school? He's been put in Mrs Khan's class. They can't find an assistant that speaks his language. Poor little blighter. Josie and Michael and Tom all looked over at me and I looked back at them and then we stood very still together. I knew we were all thinking the exact same thing because our faces frowned at the exact same time. We were wondering what a refugee kid was doing in our class. Then the lady who had talked about the sun said, It'll cause trouble, you mark my words, they're only coming over to take our jobs. Carefully, so that no one else would see us, we all looked over our shoulder and saw that it was Mr Brown and Mrs Grimsby who were talking. Mr Brown shrugged and then said, If he's from that awful war on the news, I feel sorry for the kid. Can't blame him for wanting to get out of that death trap. 
Humph, said Mrs. Grimsby. A bother, the whole lot of them. Wouldn't trust one as far as I could throw them. Just you wait and see. It's our kids who will suffer, just because these ones are coming over to do what they like. I could tell that Mr. Brown didn't like what she was saying, because he frowned and shook his head, and then took a step to the side. I like Mr. Brown. He's Charlie's dad. Charlie's one of the boys in upper school. Everyone knows who he is because he always steals at least three puddings for the pudding tray every lunchtime, so there's never ever enough to go around. He's almost famous for setting off the fire alarm to get out of a science test. He's always getting into trouble, but I don't think Mr Brown knows about that because whenever he cries out, Charlie, my old boy, what have you been up to today? And Charlie says, nothing. Mr Brown beams at him. Charlie tells everyone that his dad is a boxer, but I don't think that can be true. He has a long beard, and if I was a boxer fighting him, I'd just pull his beard all the time and win. I look to the right over at Mrs Grimsby, her face all sour and pink and angry, and decided I didn't like her very much. She's the grandmother of a girl called Nellie, who's in the year below us. Nellie's one of the most popular girls in school, mainly because she's won every burping competition the school's ever had. She can either burp sing famous songs and is always challenging everyone to try and beat her. I was looking up at Mrs Grimsby and thinking about all the things she had said when Josie suddenly poked me on the arm. Look! When I looked back through the railings, Mrs Carr and the new boy were in the playground and already talking to the woman with the red scarf. So I ran just as fast as I could and gave the new boy the special orange. As usual, he didn't say thank you and he didn't smile, but I saw his eyes widen when he saw the drawing of the smiley face and the sticker on the orange. And for the first time ever, he looked up at me with his lion eyes and didn't look away. I knew right away that he wasn't frightened of me any more. I stared back and gave him a small smile. I wanted him to know that it didn't matter if he was a refugee kid. I still wanted to be his friend. I think he must have understood, because he gave me a nod that no one else could see. I wish he had smiled back, because you can only ever know that a person's really your friend when they like you enough to smile back at you. But it was okay, because the nod felt like a promise, and I knew that I wouldn't have to wait too long before the smile followed. <laughs>